All right. Time for another episode of the Sci-Fi Podcast. All right, good. Great opening theme, really uh, transcendent. I, I, uh, I like that. I think the opening theme is a reflection of uh, my emotional state at the moment, which is uh, wobbly and out of tune. Very good. So I think before we go, do anything else, the thing we need to talk about here is they, there are pictures of the new bat suit that are out. Everyone is talking about it. It's a thing. Something we have to deal with. We've got to breathe and accept that this is what is happening. I looked at it, um, and uh, here's here's my take. Here's my hot take on it. I think they need to go back to doing full spandex for Batman. That's my vote. I think it makes a lot more sense. Like, if, listen, the guy's supposed to be a ninja. If he's such a good ninja, he should not be in situations where he's being shot at. He should sneak around the bad guys, collect evidence... Do a little bit of martial arts here, a little bit of martial arts there, and be a bit more covert about it. But more importantly, here's my vote for why we should go back to full spandex. I think a guy wearing armor is a practical person and somebody who doesn't want to die. A guy wearing full spandex, the brighter the better, no superpowers, that's not a guy you want to mess with. It's not a guy you want to mess with at all. Uh, this person uh, has uh, given up, and uh, they're going to take you with them. That's what's happening. So I, uh, my, that would be my vote. I think he needs to go full spandex uh, and bring back the nipples, nipples and spandex. He will be ten times scarier to the common criminal than a guy wearing Kevlar. That's The cops wear Kevlar. No one cares. I'm telling you, that's my, that's my take on it. Other sci-fi news. Uh, they're announcing that somebody else is going to make another Star Wars. Everyone, I feel like every five days, so-and-so is going to make a Star Wars movie. So-and-so is going to make a Star Wars movie. We're going to do another Star Wars movie with so-and-so. So, uh, I don't know how... It's just going to... It's going to keep going. It's, I think... Because when I, when I grew up, it was, right after, it was right after the movies had come out, and there was that period where there was nothing, you know, for what, about 20 years? And I'm not, I am not the person who has said this. Someone else said this, but I, it was a really good point that they made, that the less Star Wars there is, the more special it is. And that the more ubiquitous it becomes, it loses that specialness not that any of this matters you know from what I keep reading the coronavirus is going to kill us all in 10 days anyway but I do feel like it's become uh, it's become not special now that, that there's so much of it out there then again um, by that logic I should only be releasing, you know, one podcast every 20 years. And then people will say, well, that's really special when Josh releases a podcast. I'm doing two a week, so um, we're not, uh, I'm achieving the opposite uh, of this. People are going to be done. And by people, I mean, uh, from my, from what the stats are telling me, eight people. And I can't tell, by the way, if the eight people is me just uh, clicking on the link eight times. I don't know. I noticed, though, that recently uh, there was, according to the stats, uh, there might be one or two people listening uh, from South America and one person listening from, I think, Sweden. Uh, To all of you, I say hello, and on behalf of America, I'm sorry. Uh, Thanks for joining in. Uh, Hopefully uh, hopefully you'll find this productive. I'm already uh, disappointed in myself with this project because the idea was I only wanted to focus on classic sci-fi, but if I'm trying to do one episode a week, it's uh, 
the number of episodes I need to churn out is faster than uh, classic sci-fi that I can read. So I'm cheating a little bit, and uh, now I'm including movies. But then when I say I'm cheating, which is hysterical, but who's playing the game? <laughs> There's no game to be played. All right, so um, I wanted to focus today on Blade Runner. And uh, I wanted to start by uh, quoting a joke I wrote on Twitter years ago that's still my favorite Blade Runner joke, which is uh, somebody flirting with a Blade Runner at a bar, and they say, So how long you been running Blade? I think we can end the podcast there. Uh, So uh, Blade Runner. Here's the thing about Blade Runner. I have, the last two or three times I have started to watch Blade Runner, uh, it ended with me successfully falling asleep. It's a great movie. I don't mean to, I don't mean to, to bag on it, but I gotta say, it's a tad slow paced. Uh, which is ironic, considering it has Runner in the title of the movie. Uh, this is, this is a Blade saunter, is what this feels like. A Blade stroll, a casual Blade stroll through the plot. But we're going to jump right in. In 2019, Los Angeles, it's very weird watching a movie that takes place in 2019 and 2020. It, as soon as I see that, it takes me right out of it, and I'm like, ah. Ah, this isn't, it's no longer, what it, ah, no, it's no longer the future. I love, though, that in this, even in this, 19, uh, this uh, 2019 Los Angeles, there's all it does is rain. <laughs> uh they got that wrong. Should have gone with the drought uh, angle. In, 29, in 2019 Los Angeles, former policeman Rick Deckard is detained by Officer Gaff and brought to his former supervisor, Bryant. So that sentence I just said to you, uh, if I feel like in the movie it took approximately 30 minutes to do that. And 29 of those 30 minutes was uh, Deckard in the flying car looking at the city as they flew from one destination to the other. That's what Blade Runner is. It's a series of conversations. I think it's five conversations. And in between each conversation is a 20-minute shot of a car flying through a futuristic city. It's like they wrote the script. It's like, this is going to be a great short film. And then it was like, hey, hey, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Guys, I built an entire scale model of the city of Los Angeles, and we're going to use this. This took six months of my life. My wife and children left me for this model, okay? This is going in the movie. Yeah, but we don't need it. We just just need like a one matte painting that establishes it. No, 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 no! You don't understand, okay? My life is destroyed because of this model. You are going, this movie is going to be 99% showing the model, 1% people talking. That is how it is going to go. All right, so Deckard, whose job as a Blade Runner was to track down bioengineered humanoids known as replicants and retire, or in parentheses, kill them, is informed that four replicants are on Earth illegally. Now, what I remember about this scene is that the, the chief of police's office, it's like this small cramped office, but it, it is located inside what appears to be the interior of a giant cathedral. Almost as if they had to move the normal police station to the cathedral. And he was like, I want you to take my office. Oh, you mean, you mean move your stuff into the... No, no, no. I want you to take my entire office, the walls and the ceiling as well. I, I I don't understand. I mean, we have there's we have plenty of space for you to set up your thing. No, I want my office. It doesn't feel I can't I can't police unless I have this exact office. If if it's any bi- if the office is any bigger than 150 square feet, I I have trouble concentrating. It's just it's a it's a tech. Okay, you want me to police? You want me to police well? You're gonna move my office into this giant cathedral. Okay. 
Okay, Deckard starts to leave, but Bryant ambiguously threatens him, and he stays. Okay, this is a cheap shot, but I, I feel like he, the, ambigu- the, the ambiguity was, if you don't do this, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to force you to watch the director's cut of this movie. Boom! Rim shot. Uh, the two watch a video of a Blade Runner named Holden administering the voigt kampf test, which is designed to distinguish replicants from humans based on their emotional response to questions. So, when I watch these movies, and they spend the whole movie trying to determine if the, if the robot is human or how human is the robot or should they be treated like a... You know, I think there comes a point where it's human enough. We should just... They're, they're human. It's human enough. They look human. All right. You cast Daryl Hannah. Come on. That's, that's, that is more than human. That's human enough. I am already trying to treat all the robots like humans. I always say please and thank you when I talk to Siri. I want her to remember this for when the robot apocalypse happens and they're deciding which humans to kill and which humans to keep as pets. I make a great chihuahua. I'm pitching that right now. The test subject, Leon, shoots Holden on the second question. So, Holden is supposed to be this great Blade Runner and uh, doesn't even have a gun, just is asking questions. I see why they went to Deckard. I think they'd say to Deckard, you're the best Blade Runner. This was the best Blade Runner. You're much better than this guy because unlike this guy, you have a gun. This guy did not. He was, he had a briefcase and uh, he had some cigarettes, but he did not have a gun. Uh, he missed that part of it. Like he found, he found the replicant, you know. Uh, he, uh, he blade ran, but uh, then I... Did he forget the gun? I don't know. What did he think he was going to do? He was going to just talk the replicant down? He's not really good at planning ahead. You are good at planning ahead because you have a gun. And we, we don't have anyone else who can do that. So we need you to solve this case. Bryant wants Decker to retire Leon and the other Nexus 6 replicants. Roy Batty, Zora... And Priest. So the main bad guy, played by Rudger Hauer, great performance. The character's name is Roy Batty. And he's apparently a homicidal, sadistic replicant. And his name is Batty. Bit of foreshadowing right there. And he's supposed to be a military replicant, too. He was designed to be a soldier. And they named him Roy Batty. Unless he named himself. But is that... Now, because he's an uh, industrial model that was built for service, was that the name of the model? What's this? Uh, this This is the Roy Batty model. Okay, what about this one over there? That's the Shlomo Johnson model. Oh, what is what does Shlomo Johnson do? Oh, uh, he, uh, he does accounting. Well, that sounds kind of racist. I mean, Shlomo, you saying, yeah, we find that if we build a replicant that looks Jewish and we sell it as an accountant, they tend to buy more than the, the replicants who are accountants who are not Jewish looking. I mean, it's just, you know, we're just going by the market. That's all you can do. That's horrible. Well, I mean, welcome to the human race in 2019 Los Angeles where it's raining all the time. Bryant has Deckard meet with the CEO of the company that creates the replicants, Eldon Tyrrell, so he can administer the test on a Nexus 6 to see if it works. So, uh, in between that and the chief telling him to to go find these replicants, by the way, was another 19-minute shot of him flying through the city. The most dramatic parts of Blade Runner are the commute from one place to the other. I've never seen this before. All 
the conversation is all very subtle and, you know, the acting is very subtle and, and there's a lot going on. But then it gets, the, the biggest drama is, uh, they're flying through the city. Oh no, there's a traffic light. Are they going to make it? Nope. No, they're not going to make it. Tyrrell expresses his interest in seeing the test fail first and asks him to administer it on his assistant, Rachel. So Rachel, apparently, who is a replicant, has no idea that she is a replicant, even though she walks and talks like a robot. It should be pretty clear. Amazing to go through your whole life not realizing you're a replicant. I'd like to see a scene where a replicant realizes they're a replicant and then they say to themselves, well, I don't know, is there any difference? I don't feel any different. Is this what's... No, you were, you were actually built. Wait, you're telling me that somebody designed me to have IBS? Yeah, that's correct. Who would do that? Well, it's, you're, a, you're a model that's designed to complain to people and uh, they enjoy watching you suffer. Really? Yeah. How well do I sell? Not that, not that well. There's a small niche audience who likes that kind of replicant. But uh, we've dis- we discontinued it. There are no more parts for you, by the way. So once your intestines go, that's it. Okay, good. After a much longer than standard test, Deckard concludes that Rachel is a replicant who believes she is human. Here's my other cheap shot. Uh, He showed her the movie Blade Runner and she didn't fall asleep. Boom! Rim shot. Tyrrell explains that uh, she's an experiment who's been given false memories to provide an emotional cushion. Uh, I love that. The, they did that, and there's no possible way that could go wrong. What a brilliant move. We're going to give uh, something with superhuman strength false memories, so when they find out that it's false memories, uh, it'll be so much easier to stab my neck because we built them to be super strong. Perfect. Beautiful. Searching Leon's hotel room, Deckard finds photos and the synthetic snake scale. I, can I say, by the way, I'm glad I'm reading this because the lighting in that scene was so dark, I had no idea what was going on. So thank you, Wikipedia. Good. Snake scale, that's what that was, as opposed to a uh, shadow. Roy and Leon investigate a replicant eye manufacturing laboratory and learn of J.F. Sebastian, a gifted genetic designer who works closely with Tyrrell. So, uh, as you can see, the movie's really taking off here. Uh, really, uh, we're, we are running into action. We are blade running into action here as two sets of characters now are trying to solve a mystery and basically having conversations. It's like I'm watching twice as much Law & Order in, at once. It's, it's Law & Order with spaceships. Deckard returns to his apartment where Rachel is waiting. I'm curious to know how she got into the apartment. Oh, right, she's a robot. That should be another tip-off right there. She just uh, asked the computer to open the door. She tries to prove her humanity by showing him a family photo, but after Deckard reveals that her memories are implants from Tyrrell's niece, she leaves in tears. And I think they should have included this line. In, uh, Harrison Ford should have said this to her. Listen, listen, I'm a blade runner, okay? Not a blade comforter. There's a difference. Meanwhile, Priest locates Sebastian and manip- manipulates him to gain his trust. And the scene basically was, Hi, I'm Daryl Hannah, and yeah, whatever you want. I got, yeah, we, yes. What do you want me to do? I am yours to command. Look at me. I have not been with a woman uh, ever. <laughs> a photograph from Leon's apartment and the snake scale lead Decker to a strip club where Zora works. And this, 
the scene of him an- analyzing the photograph, by the way, I feel like is in every science fiction movie. The, it, there's a rule. No matter what, there needs to be a scene where they analyze a photograph using the computer and they say, analyze grid 9A. Enhance. Remove shadows. Enhance. Repeat and augment. The, one, all, everything that, I, I don't know, sci, people who make sci-fi movies are in love with the fact that in the future, it's a, really a lot easier to look at pictures. Computers help us look at pictures and find clues. I, I, I swear to you, that is in every science fiction film. If that, in fact, if that's not in a science fiction film, the movie bombed. That's my theory. I've seen it in Star Trek. I've seen it in Babylon 5. Science fiction movie or TV, there has to be a scene where they are analyzing a photograph and, uh, and zooming in and removing you know, people from the foreground and then figuring, figuring it out. After a confrontation and chase, Deckard kills Zora. Well, finally some running. Blade running, no less. And that's usually the part of the movie where I'm suddenly, I wake up. <laughs> ah, wait, what, what? Blade running. All right, good. Uh, Bryant orders him also to retire Rachel, who, uh, who has disappeared from the Tyrrell Corporation. All right, now, now it's getting, now the plot is thickening here. We don't want to kill, we like Rachel. The, you know, the audience is on board with Rachel. She's attractive. She's kind. She's in danger. Oh, this is just perfect 1980s sexism at play. After Deckard spots Rachel in a crowd, he is attacked by Leon, who knocks the gun out of Deckard's hand and brutally attacks him. I I don't understand why they don't send more than one person after a, a machine with superior agility and strength. That one always kind of threw me. They're like, yeah, let's, you know, who will get our bet and, and their best guy, quote unquote, your bet. The best guy is this older alcoholic ex-cop who's having a nervous breakdown. That's our best guy. Interesting. I don't think uh, the police want to solve this case. As he's about to kill Deckard, Rachel saves him by using Deckard's gun to kill Leon. Well, there it is. Now, now we have to like her. That's all there is to it. You think he would have liked her before that, though? I mean, because she was nice, but it takes saving his life for him, I guess, to turn around. Really? They return to Deckard's apartment, and during a discussion, he promises not to track her down, and she abruptly tries to leave. Deckard restrains her, making her kiss him. She continues to resist, and he blocks her attempts to leave. He persists in his advances, and she ultimately relents. Well, this is a problem. (laughs) Uh, This does not feel comfortable to watch in 2020. Somehow this was okay in the 80s. Odd. Uh, This feels... Oh, this is... uh, I'm sorry. What? Uh, yeah, uh, saying yes eventually. That's, that's okay. That's, that'll hold up in court, won't it? I think he's going to have to have a long conversation with Blade HR. Arriving at Sebastian's apartment, Roy tells priests that the others are dead. Sympathetic to their plight, Sebastian reveals that because of Methuselah syndrome, a genetic premature aging, aging disorder... His life will be cut short, just like them. So basically, to review, the replicants only can live for four years. And they've escaped, and they're on Earth, and the police have hired a Blade Runner to kill them, but they're all in year four. So, do they even need to hire the police? I feel like this... uh, does he, does, did this even need to happen? 
Sebastian and Roy gain entrance into Tyrrell's penthouse, where Roy demands more life from his maker. And, uh, yeah, so let me get this straight. The giant uh, robot warrior that you created, uh, that you thought you could control, is now about to kill you. How do they not see... How do the creators never see this coming? That's, they never, that's the other thing in science fiction. The creators never see this coming. Um, easy for me to say. I've never created anything. But then again, I'm part of the human race that does create things. And, the, you know, they created the cell phone and now everyone is on their cell phones and there's probably a higher risk of cancer. So we are all this person. Uh, what am I mocking here? I'm mocking myself. And that's what science fiction does. It goes, hey, look, this is you being an idiot. This is what will happen if you continue to be an idiot today. And we watch the science fiction and we go, oh, that, that was cool. Uh, the, yeah, that was that was great. I don't like the bat suit. That's what we do. Uh, Tyrrell tells him it is impossible. I think that's prophetic about this, by the way, is that it's that it prophesies uh, uh, planned obsolescence, which is this thing that I hate. I've noticed that every electronic device that I buy, after about two or three years, it suddenly uh, takes out a uh, a samurai blade and commits seppuku and just stops working. I, uh, I'm not a fan of that. My mom has a radio that she bought, I think in the 1960s that still works. And all of that is just, is disappeared now. I mean, just everything is disposable and uh, the, the planned obsolescence. Though there are some companies that don't do planned op- obsolescence and they should be praised. They do what's called unplanned obsolescence. That's where we don't know when the thing's going to break. Uh, good luck. Roy confesses that he has done questionable things, but Tyrrell dismisses this, praising Roy's advanced design and accomplishments in a short life. I think this character, too, the, the, the uh, warrior here, Um, because at the end he has this great monologue that I think uh, uh, Rutger Hauer actually kind of wrote some of it himself. It's very poetic. So he's a warrior, but he's also a poet. Maybe that was the other reason. They cut this scene, but the other reason he came to Earth was he was trying to publish a book of poetry uh, called, uh, you know, Reflections of a Guy Ripping Out the Eyeball of Other People. And it was a terrible title. The title is why it didn't get sold. And, you know, the other replicants were like, you got, you got to come up with a better title than that. There's just, there's no poetry in the title. And he's like, that's, that's, I'm speaking from my heart. Do you even have a heart? You're technically a replicant. I'm speaking from my pump, whatever. Whatever, Brenda. I'm not Brenda. My name is Priest. Yeah, well, you're being very Brenda right now. Brenda, by the way, this is a side note. I feel like Brenda, I saw Taylor Tomlinson use Brenda. That's sort of, uh, as her kind of that, you know, the, the white woman character. But I do feel like overall Brenda has become, I see a lot of comedians using Brenda, or I, even I just hear in, in vocabulary th- this cliche of the complainy white girl, uh, Brenda. Karen is the one that we use in the office. Uh, 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 the phrase we use in the office is if we have to yell at somebody is we go full Karen. And I don't know, maybe is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Maybe I should write a science fiction story about how uh, in the future it will be a different name that we use. Um, I don't know what name it will be. I mean, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, it'll be, uh, you know, the, you, we're going to go full data. No, that doesn't work. I don't like that. I don't like what I just said there. I don't even like this tangent. I don't like this tangent at all uh, because, number one, I don't like mentioning Taylor Tomlinson. I don't want to rip her off. That is not my intention here. Uh, uh, number two, what does this say? But I do feel like this is this, this trope of the uh, entitled white... Li- I've seen a lot of comedians talk about it. And when I say trope, I mean uh, reality. <laughs> real life, real people. Okay. 
Uh, so Roy kisses Tyrrell, then kills him. Uh, yeah, well, and and then that's what's going to happen. Uh, I think that's a perfect metaphor for what we're doing. We're going to be killed by ourselves as a species. And that's exactly what happens here. They make a robot warrior, warrior and they give him, uh, by the way, they dye his hair white because, you know, you definitely want, if it's one thing you want your robot warriors to do, it's really stick it out in a crowd. Deckard is later told by Bryant that Sebastian was found dead. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped something. Sebastian runs for the elevator, followed by Roy, who rides the elevator down alone. So the implication here is that he kills Sebastian. Does it matter to anyone that I included this? Would it have mattered for the movie at this point? Blade Runner feels like the studio said, you know, we want it, we want another Star Wars movie. You know who we should get to write this? Let's get John Paul Sartre. Deckard is, uh, okay, at Sebastian's apartment, Deckard is ambushed by Prius, but he kills her as Roy returns. By the way, I think Roy Returns, great name for a movie. Don't know what it's about. I think it's like Batman Returns, but uh, a little bit more laid back. Ray, Roy's body begins to fail as the end of his lifespan, lifespan nears. And uh, my thought there, he probably can't digest milk products anymore. His, he's gone full Jew. That's what's happening. Uh, he's suddenly old. Uh, he has this urge to move to Florida. It's, it's all happening in the space of 10 minutes. He chases Deckard through the building, ending up on the roof. Uh, it's a dilapidated building. Everything in this movie is dilapidated. Everything is dark and depressing and dank. Uh, there is not one park in this movie. Uh, there is not one uh, well-maintained Starbucks. It's all dank. And this is like an old 1920s apartment that they're all running through that looks terrible. But five years after the movie, I think it's going to be gentrified and it's going to be like a hipster coffee bar. Deckard tries to jump onto another roof, but is left hanging on the edge. Well, looks like he didn't blade run fast enough. But I'm bum Roy makes the jump with ease, and as Deckard's grip loosens, Roy hoists, hoists him onto the roof, saving him. Before Roy dies, he delivers a monologue about how his memories will be lost in time, like tears in rain. At which point Deckard says, oh, I, wish, I wish you could have been on my podcast. That's, uh, you got away with words, man. You got away with words. And then... Uh, and then he dies. And so I think I just watched a movie in which uh, a uh, guy kills uh, two women. Uh, and uh, almost gets killed by two men. And that's pretty much it. And I call them, I guess technically they're replicants, whatever. I call them women. I call them humans, women and men. They seem to be so close to the human beings at that, like I keep saying, whatever. Wow, I'm getting so into this. I'm the, I, even, this is a fictional thing. And I am so worried about internet backlash that I am like totally siding with the replicants. Gaff arrives and shouts to Deckard about Rachel. It's too bad she won't live, but then again, who does? How is this guy not being investigated by internal affairs? That's my question. And I like that he, he uh, again, he ends with who does. I'm telling you, Sartre took a pass on this script. Deckard returns to his apartment and finds Rachel asleep in his bed. They leave the apartment block together. And it's left open-ended until the sequel comes along, which finds a way to give them a depressing ending. So, beautiful. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I like Blade Runner. I like watching Blade Runner when I say to myself, man, I'm really down. Uh, I just want to watch a movie that reflects exactly how I'm feeling right now, uh, but with cool cityscapes. And then I go to Blade Runner. I want to be depressed uh, and look at flying cars. Blade Runner. Boom. That's the ticket.
All right, so what do we uh, what do we learn from Blade Runner? What is Blade Runner telling us about ourselves? What's the essence of our, our what, what Blade Runner is telling us? Um, I think the other thing that the other uh, theme here, because in some versions of Blade Runner, like the director's cut version, I think the director thought that he wanted to make Deckard a replicant himself, and all of his memories were implanted, uh, which would be a great twist. And uh, which, but I think the larger commentary on this is how much of our, you know, how much of our lives are based on lies. Because in reality, we don't even, we're not even very good at remembering things as they actually happened. You know, I have all these memories, for instance, of being made fun of when I was in school. But then if I go back and I look at it objectively... You know, yeah, sure, I was teased here and there, but compared to what other kids went through, it was so not that bad. And nobody was really bullying me in high school. It was elementary school, I was being teased. But by the time I got to high school, no one bullied me. And yet, I think I, I have labeled high school as this horrible time in my life where I just, I couldn't fit in, nobody liked me, and that's, people liked me. I mean, I wasn't, Mr. Popular, but people were okay with me. I wasn't this dark, depressing loner. I was a dark, depressing person with friends, actually. If anything, I was a loner wannabe. But I rewrote the story in my head and just wrote it off as, ah, it was a miserable experience, I wasn't accepted, blah, blah, blah. So that's an interesting way of looking at it, how we we shape the present by the stories we tell ourselves about the past. And if you remove those stories, what are we? Ooh, this is getting philosophical, isn't it? What are we when we remove all that? We can be whatever we want to be. We can be whatever we want to be. So, the question is, am I depressed because that's who I am, or am I depressed because on a deeper level I am choosing to be depressed? All right, I am choosing to be depressed, but can I just say that I've tried happiness and joy and it just doesn't feel right? (laughs) It feels like a lie. It just does not feel honest somehow. (laughs) Like I, was, I remember I was doing this uh, uh, seminar, and one thing we were supposed to do is at the, at the beginning of every seminar, whenever the person leading the seminar walked in, we were supposed to stand up and clap enthusiastically and say, yeah, yes, great, awesome. And I could not, I just, ref- I could not, I didn't want to fake that. So I clapped, and I stood up, but I did not want to smile and go, yeah, yay, and, and, and listen, the person was very good at what they did. They deserved to be praised. But I didn't feel that. And I didn't want to lie about that. And I didn't want to put on that show. I wanted to be me. I wanted to be... I guess I was choosing to be depressed in that moment. So I have to take responsibility for this. Uh, and just uh, uh, accept that. It's weird. I mean, I, so I, am I choosing to be depressed, though, or is this how I'm actually feeling? Now I'm, uh, well, now this is becoming Blade Ponderer. Blade Philosophy. Blade Philosopher. That's what this is. That's what this is. Yes, I just, I don't want to lie about how I feel. That's what I, I hate doing that. Uh... But by the same token, whenever I feel joy, I get afraid of feeling joy because I, um, what if I was, what if I was a replicant? What kind of, they screwed up on my model. That's, I, I don't know what they were aiming for exactly. Other thing, but this is my other theory about AI because, uh, uh, I was told in high school actually by one of the counselors that, uh, they've noticed that the smarter that the students were, the smarter students tended to have more emotional problems 
uh, than uh, uh, the students who, I don't want to say necessarily were not as smart, but maybe the students who did not excel as well academically or do not have um, a propensity to do well academically. And so my theory is, is that if, if computers are going to become self-aware and hundreds of times smarter than people, how do we know, how do we know they're not going to become a hundred times more neurotic and we're going to be dealing with this giant artificial intelligence that can control all the nuclear missiles that's saying, I know I'm a machine and not a human, but I'm really afraid of this coronavirus. I need to wash my hands. You don't have hands. Well, somebody take some hand sanitizer and put it all over me. I just, I, I know it's irrational, but I just feel this. I'm really concerned. All right, guys, we did it. 40 minute podcast. Uh, we talked about Blade Runner. There it is. Hey, I'll try this. Uh, if any of you have a science fiction movie or book that you want me to review, uh, tweet or Instagram at Nerdy Virgin. Say what it is, and I'll talk about it next week. Now, there's two possibilities. If it's a movie, I'll probably be able to watch it next week. If it's a book, let's be honest. Uh, I will read the Wikipedia of the book next week. Let's see where this takes us. If no one does it, then I'll probably, then I will pick something myself. Until then, uh, oh, you know the other thing I should do? Hey, uh, like uh, my YouTube page. I think it's either Joshua Snyder or Nerdy Virgin. Uh, follow me on Instagram, at Nerdy Virgin. Follow me on Twitter, at Nerdy Virgin. My website is uh, nerdyvirgin.com. Uh, I've got a CD on there. I've got some books that I've written that are sci-fi-ish. Uh, that you can get on Amazon, but uh, everything you can find is on nerdyvirgin.com. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, I will next week I will also announce maybe another date that I'm performing somewhere. How about that? How about that?